Hello, and welcome to another episode of Scions of the Southland. My name is Akshay Ishwaran, and joining me is a man who loves his 0-0 soccer draws, Mr. Jake Grant. How are you doing today, sir? I'm uh, a little hoarse. I got to tell you that. A little hoarse. Like a little Sebastian, or what, what kind of horse are we talking about here? Uh, let's just say I couldn't speak after the basketball game yesterday. Yeah, that was uh, that was an interesting one. I I will say definitely a uh, you know a change of pace from the normal GT men's basketball saga, if you will. Oh, for sure. They uh, I it's always it Syracuse coming to town has not failed me other than that one time that we got like imploded. I, I we won't talk about that, but. Always been an interesting game when they come to town. Yeah, I mean, I think your freshman year was the air ball game. Um, Has it been that yeah, long? Yeah, that, oh. that my freshman year. Oh, I feel old. That was a long time ago. It, it was a hot minute ago. Um, they, they did the shirts the next year after that, I believe. Yeah, and that year we got imploded. We can, uh, we can move on and not talk about that anymore, but we will talk about <laughs> – the Cuse men's basketball game. We'll talk about a lot of stuff around the ACC. Um, so, if you don't mind, let me throw our usual 30 minutes on the clock and uh, get started. What say you? Yeah, fine by me. I'm uh, rocking the sunglasses and croaky they gave out yesterday. So, uh, while the sun is still dying in the sky let's uh get the show on the road all right three two one here we go first up is track and field who are at acc indoor championships this weekend what can you tell me about that um it was uh i'd say a vaguely successful weekend uh they both finished in 11th place but the top of our lineup was pretty uh Pretty good. We got some first and second uh, team all ACC finishes, uh, including excellent pole vault, and then great uh, two great races from Andrew Kent in the five thousand and the three thousand meters. Uh, he finished second and fourth, respectively. And then uh, Nicole Feigens, 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 however you say that. Sorry, Nicole. Um, as always, being pretty excellent. So uh, you know, reliable, reliable show from the. Uh, from the places we kind of expect it, I would say. Mm -hmm. Solid performance. That was also on TV. That was a, that was an interesting one. Don't see that very often. It was good to see it on TV, uh, but the swimmer in me was a little bit disappointed because uh, ACC's is always a bit of a show. Um, so I would like to be able to watch that live. But uh, it was good to see track because, quite frankly, I see a lot more swimming than I do track just because the rest of their meets are on ACC Network Extra, but um, uh, other names I want to throw in before we move on. Cameron O'Neill's um, bronze in the long jump. Uh, always good to see guys on the podium. Um, there's a couple other names. Uh, Anna Witherspoon and Taylor Grimes, seventh and eighth in the hurdles. Uh, we've traditionally had a fairly strong hurdles. I think that's probably one of our like reliably great um, reliably great events. So that's good. And then um, Kind of, you know, it, it was a usual suspects kind of weekend, though, I'd say. Mm -hmm. Let's pivot over to swim then, uh, since you mentioned it. I think that also kind of was a usual suspects kind of weekend uh, for the men's swim and dive team at ACC Championships. Yeah, um, we talked about the women last weekend. Um, they, uh, Them and the diving was last week. Uh, we'll see diving again before NCAAs in the zones. But in the meantime... Uh, we had the men's meet up in Greensboro. Uh, Georgia Tech sent, actually, I don't know how many guys we sent up there, but you, you get a handful of entries per event in the individual events and one relay. Um, all of our relays are pretty good. Uh, so we did start off strong. Um, I think we were in fourth place after night one. Well, night one in diving. Um, but we eventually finished in seventh, which is higher than last year by two spots. Uh, that was great to see. Um, the depth has improved from last year, but 
I mean, like you said, if, if you would have sat me down last year and told me to write this year's recap, I probably would have gone, well, Christian Ferraro popped off, Kyle Pumputi's popped off, our medley's pretty good, and uh, dot, 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 fill in the rest. But um, but no, good performances from a couple freshmen. And then uh, if we're talking about a most improved over his time on the flats, Kyle Barone, Baroni, sorry, I don't know how you say that one either. Um, really, really good work uh, from him in terms of how he's grown in the last two or three years on the flats. I have a whole diatribe about what it means for NCAAs, but uh, you can kind of pick your poison on whether or not you want to dive into that. Well, I, I think it's important that we cover that, right? Because that's the next step for this team because they, as you mentioned, diving has the zones coming up in, you know, in the interim between the NCAA championships. But yeah. the next step for people like Kyle Pumputis, uh Kyle Barone, is that next meet, is that NCAA meet. So tell us a little bit more about how that works, the structure, and what entries that Tech has now. All right, yeah. So... I deal with this stuff a lot just as a swimmer who likes watching this stuff and even I get confused. So this morning I tried to go in, uh, break it down into easily digestible chunks and you're going to give me a yay or a nay. If, uh, I guess we, we understand what's going on with, with each step. All right. All right. I'll play the, uh, I'll, I'll put on the layman act here. All right. All right. So NCAAs big meat. Um, unlike, typical standards in in a lot of you know your olympic trials your um i guess state times if you're if you grew up an age group swimmer um generally those are pretty consistent there's a cutoff if you make a time you go swim the race at ncaa's right or at your normal meet yeah 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 so unlike that or i i should also frame with or you have a set number of entries like you do at the acc's Anyways, um, NCAAs is a weird hybrid of both. So, at my NCAA, favorite, yes, there are two time standards: the A cuts and the B cuts, or the automatic and provisional cuts. If you get an A mm -hmm. cut, you're in. Okay, but if you get an A cut, all of your B cuts are also in. Oh boy. Okay. Yes. So, okay. So, so, so just to just to break down this part, if you get an A cut, your um, all of your other, if you have other qualifying provisional times, those are automatically promoted. Yes, but you can okay. only swim a set number of entries per. Oh hour. my! Uh. <laughs> so Kyle Pumputis, for example, has cuts total in the hundred breast, two hundred breast. 200 IM and 100 fly going into yesterday. Okay, so that's four? Yes. And yesterday night, he got an A cut in the 200 breast. So now all four of those events are promoted with the 200 breast being his primary. Yes, he, he's going to swim the 200 breast. That's his A cut. But he okay. can only swim uh, three, I believe, individual events. So one of those events he's not going to swim – I think it's a hundred fly. He's a breaststroker and an IMer, so I, I don't see why he'd swim the hundred fly. But basically, right. you know, you, you get to pick two more. Okay. The same thing applies to uh, Christian Ferraro, who last night got a two an A cut in the two hundred fly, uh, and so his two B cuts are in as well. Okay. All right. So we got that. Seems not bad enough. All right. Or I guess it so, seems not bad. Once all those A cuts and then their associated B cuts are accounted for, they add a number of B cuts to each event one at a time until all the events have the same number of swimmers. Okay. So what they do uh, is they start with, say, the 50 freestyle. And the first person in the B cuts who, you know, didn't get an A cut. So all those A cuts and the their, the B cuts associated with people who got A cuts are taken out of the equation. Okay, so we, so we now have slotted in the A cuts and the promoted B cuts. All of those are oh. slotted in. Now we start filling space with B, 
with people who only had B cuts and didn't get promoted. Correct. So okay. they also, once they're invited in an event, can swim B cuts in other events. We have an example of this on our team. Should I illustrate with that? Go for it. All right. So you can kind of judge where this like invite is going to lie based on the previous year's meet. And based on 2019, which is the last NCAAs we can go off of, uh, Batur Unlu and Kyle Baroni both have times that would have gotten invited in 2019. Mm -hmm. So uh, this happens for Unlu in the 200 free, uh, and he has two other events he could swim, uh, the 100 and the 500 free. And then Barone's 100 back, um, and he also had B cuts in the 50 free, 100 fly, and 200 fly. So theoretically, okay. if they got invited with those 200 free and 100 back times, which seem likely to get invited, they would be able to swim two more events outside of those. The, the 100 free and 500 free for Unlu, along with this 200 free invite, and Baroni probably the 50 free and 100 fly to go with this 100 back, but I'm not as sure which fly event or if you'd swim both flies and not the 50 free or you know what I'm saying. Okay. All right. So once those people are accounted for to get all the events to like even number of entries, one at a time, they pick the next highest B cut until they reach a total athlete cap. Okay. So basically you have a big scraggly, say like a bar graph that's got some tall bars and some short bars. You make all the bars the same height. Okay. And then you increment by one swimmer per event at a time. Okay. All right. So now that we have all of our individual entries, if you have an individual, oh, well, I guess I should say this as well. There are also several other Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets with B cuts on the men's and women's side. Um, Austin Daniel, um, uh, Clark Wakeland, Daniel Jacobs, Caleb Brisky, Justin Alderson, and Daniel Kurtej are our other athletes with B cuts, but those weren't really close in the past. So don't, doesn't seem likely. Anyways, once you get one person invited or automatically qualified, which we're good because KO and Christian definitely going to be at NCAAs, you can mm -hmm. bring your relays. So if they're in a relay, the relay team gets picked up. No. So if you if you get an individual into NCAAs, you can bring your A cut relays and mm -hmm. any B cut relays on top of that. This is getting very, very complicated and it also is, very, very long winded. It is very convoluted and long winded. But basically, we have at least a provisional cut in every relay. So all five of our relays are going. And they're credited to the team, so we can bring whoever the heck we want to swim them. Okay, so I, I think the summary here is this is one of the strongest showings in uh, on the men's side at NCAA's in, in a quite a few years. I think is the TLDR. Yes, I project that we will have at least twelve individuals uh, plus all five of our relays um, at NCAA's. Okay. Which I'm down. Is, you know, the, it's it's getting three events each out of our four best swimmers, and our both of our medley relays, the 200 and the 400, have the potential to score top eight, a final, whatever you want to call it, last heat. They 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 could do that. So okay, so that's 12 just on the men's side, or is that including the women too? 12 on the men's side. Uh, women, I think there was only one or two in the IQs, um, and I. Don't I, I don't think we have any eight cut relays. So the women mm -hmm. we're just looking at individual events there. So it's less it's less top twenty five potential if you catch my drift. Mm -hmm. Like the men the men don't have the depth to take on the Cal, Texas, Stanford, UGA, Florida, those kind of teams. But I mean, finishing ranked in the top twenty five would not be a, a bad finish for any team. So and I, I mean, I think we see that in their current cap rankings from both sides. I mean, the, the men are what we said, 18th, and then the women are 45th. So yeah. if you're using those as a proxy for NCAA championships, 
I think that kind of tracks like our predictions here kind of track. Yeah. The, um, uh, the swim cloud also does a like championship roster building function in their like metric. Cause they, they, they mm-hmm. have a top database as well. And I believe they had the men at 17th when I checked last week. So that kind of tracks with what we have as well, which would be their best showing at NCAAs in quite some time. Uh, 2019 was a pretty big deal to finish uh, top 25. And I think we got mm-hmm. 25th a couple years before that. But, um, but yeah, comfortably in the top 20 would be an excellent way to end the year. They, they're, a, they're a very top-heavy team. Um, and at NCAAs, it, it comes down to your top guys, not your, you know, not your depth pieces. It's in the C final kind of thing. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I'll take it. I will. I will take success where we can find it. Uh, speaking of that, we have both tennis programs in action uh, over the last few days this weekend. Uh, the women uh, had a close victory over Clemson, while the men. Uh, fell 4-1 to UNC. I only caught bits and pieces of both of these. I'm not sure what your viewing situation was, but just based on these results, what what do you think we can sort of divine out? Well, I think the, the biggest thing you have to you have to take away from this weekend is uh, Ava Roster's back. True, and true, true, true. She, she fell quickly against Clemson. I think it was 6-3, 6-2. But... Um, just to you know, get back in, get get in playing shape again. Maybe it was. I, I assume if it was COVID, then she probably like they probably wouldn't have been still playing, you know. But um, mm-hmm. but whatever the injury is, um, or whatever the circumstance was, uh, we don't know. But uh, we're glad to see her back, and uh, you know, having having your court three gets to push, you know, whoever I think Gia Cullen was playing court three in her absence. Um, that pushes Cohen down one, puts puts Gross down one, and or Garcia Gross down one, and that that's that's a helpful domino effect if you catch my drift. Mm-hmm. And that's not to say that you know four four five and six are or three four and five in our usual lineup are bad. It's just you get an addition to the lineup, you get a shot like a boost in the arm. Shot oh in yeah, the arm, boost in the arm. It's like a uh, it's like a free agent ad in the middle of the season or something. At this point, you know, like that's a. Uh, that's a good ad. Um, I really liked um, at the end of the article that they posted in the recap on ramblinrec.com. They had a nice picture of uh, Coach Harmon and, and Clemson's head tennis coach. And uh, it's it's very refreshing to see like coaches and programs get along. I don't know. As as a uh, as a swim club, I guess we have a nice friendly rivalry with Clemson. And, and, and it's nice to see uh, a sign of, you know, mutual respect and and whatnot, even after, for, for the ladies, it was a pretty tight game. It came down to, uh, it came down to uh, court one, Kenya Jones uh, polishing off uh, Alini Luca. I think she lost 7-6 in a tie break on set two, uh, but was able to cruise to a 6-1 victory in set three uh, to seal the match. Mm-hmm. Uh, on the men's side, I caught a little bit of the doubles, and I felt like they were competitive. But if you look at the score line, you had 6-1 on court three for Tech. Uh, 6-1 going the reverse way, I think, for UNC. Um, and then an, like a 6-2 on court one. Um, on court one. And then the doubles were, or the singles were a bit of, of a massacre, if I remember correctly. So, I don't know, a bit of a mixed bag on that end. Yeah, um, the singles were really quick. If you look at uh, court five, uh, McKinney and uh, Josh Peck <laughs> from uh, UNC. I uh, almost unf- made a tweet about that, by the way. I almost I would have was- that. But, but continue, um, continue. I was going to say, uh, I think a big, the big takeaway, we, you got to give man of the match to Andres Martin, um, number 15. Mm-hmm. He's the number 51 player in the country, uh, and he came in and knocked off the number 41 player in the country in Benjamin uh, Seguin, Seguin, however you say his name, 6-1, 6-2, which is pretty uh, pretty darn convincing to me. Uh, and Brandon McKinney was giving Josh Peck a run for his money. It was 6-6, 8-8, 8-8 um, in the tiebreak. Well, they suspended is. play, yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, it did look like uh, Court 6 was struggling. I mean, Keshav Chopra and Pablo Shelcher 
fell in, in two sets, as did Marcus McDaniel. But uh, Marcus McDaniel was playing the number two singles player in the whole country. Um, and the fact that the second set was 6-4 tells me that it was pretty darn close in the second set. So You also had a new appearance of wild Brandon Freestone on court six. So a um, bit of a mixed bag. I don't remember what the lineup looked like before that substitution, but I do know that that was a substitution. Yeah. Um, the other thing I do want to say as a takeaway, I was not expecting one of our doubles teams to get a point and to go 6-1 even on court three. Good job, Andres Martin. Good job, Chen Dong. I, I, yeah, that was yeah. that was impressive. Okay. Uh, it, it, it was interesting to watch that unfold on court three, and then you sort of watch courts two and one in you know sort of the reverse fashion. Um, yeah, I mean, you got you actually got what was that? Your first sporting event in a year. Um, live almost a year. Yeah. But, and, and I mean, it was, it was a, you know, it was a good day outside. It was good to, you know, catch, catch a breeze. It was like nice, sunny and 70, but really it was an interesting experience to sort of go back and watch tennis live. Um, and also, yeah, I think all, like I said, like I said, in the lead, like all three of those, um, all three of those doubles matches were competitive, just maybe not as much as we would have liked to see in the final score. That's fair. Um, I think the uh, the takeaway is pretty decent. I I, I don't uh, I don't like just writing off L's, but like it was it looked like a fairly competitive four to one, at least based on the results. Does that does that pass the smell test for you or not really? Uh, yeah, I mean. Uh, I'll take what I can get. <laughs> yeah, uh, honestly, I, I'm not going to complain about. I, I I think I've said my piece about complaining about quality losses at this point. Yeah, the uh, the Duke match on Friday was a bit of a, a thrashing. It was six one, so not not quite as I, I don't know. You can explain it against a, the number one team in the country a little bit more. I think um, notes that I have from Duke. Uh, was a tough doubles loss. Um, it, it was uh, they lost uh, six three and seven five uh, on courts one and two, which were the, uh, the difference in the points. Um, it's tough to lose seven five. Uh, that that is a you know it it shows mm-hmm. that it's hard fought. A lot of the the sets went to uh, a third set. Um, three and four did get decided one zero as just like a tie break. So I assume they they kind of played it out. Um, but up and down the board, it was, uh, it, was it was a bit rough for Tech, I think, uh, mm-hmm. compared to you know it, it's not quite as uh, quite as good of an opponent as UNC. But I hate to I hate to end it on a dark note. But we have for them coming up. Uh, let me check who we got on the schedule. We have Clemson on Friday and. Sunday we have Georgia Southern. Uh, I expect at least one and one, and we have a decent shot against Clemson. That's on the road, so go figure. Interesting, interesting. Let's move on to the two basketball programs, which uh, both of which I have titled here as uh, what the what, what's going on here uh, with the women's program. Uh, they had an interesting week, to say the least. Uh, we we talked last week about their loss to Boston College, which was very interesting. Um, and then they also got blown out by UNC earlier this week before wrapping up their ACC uh, before wrapping up the season versus Pitt today with a win. Um, they'll appear on Friday uh, in the ACC tournament quarterfinals. My stance on this is that this is not the best time to be having results like this. I don't think there's any really ever a good time to be having results like losing to the or playing both of the bottom teams in the conference in BC and Pitt very close, um, and also getting blown out by you know a conference bottom halfer. What is your take? Um, I mean. BC is bad. That's bad. I mean, bad I was on the road, but I, I'm worried. I, 
I think we will still have a, a tournament bid, so I'm not too worried about that. But I think this is the signs showing of four months of, you know, it, it's been a short rotation. Like, and there's not much you can do about that with a small team and a young team, and and, and not a lot of, um, not a lot of wiggle room. The COVID breaks made it a, a lot of three games in a week type situation. So I'm hoping that this week um, just gives Tech some time to reset, relax, uh, heal rest up. Rest is um, the period. Yeah, rest and yeah. heal up. It's, it'd be great uh, to get uh, the Sarah Bates we had before her injury back. Don't really know the status of that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, if you, if you can make a run in the tournament, you're starting from, what, the three seed, right? So, yeah, which I believe is their best uh, ACC finish ever. So, congrats it on that. Is indeed, uh, yes. we will not be complaining about that at all. That's actually quite excellent. Um, but uh, I mean, they, they have the tools to make a run both in the ACC and in the NCAA tournament, but they are going to run into teams with more depth, uh, with more experience, and uh, less, I guess, a, a, more, a more flexible roster or a uh, or a team that hasn't been quite as worn down. And I'm not going to say that they're not done yet. They are. They still have two uh, tournaments that they can make opportunities and, and, and make runs in. But, uh, man. I, they have uh, at least two games left here, is what we're saying. Yes. At least, at at least two games. The expectation is they're on at least a seven or an eight line in the tournament. Uh, I know their stock has kind of sunk in the last few days, but... You know, that's, I mean, that's kind of what happens. But, um, but yeah, no, I I very much look forward to uh, to seeing them kind of on a bigger stage than they've been able to have lately. Uh, and uh, hopefully Coach Fortner, you know, it's, a, it's another year back with uh, a, a good core because she's keeping, I mean, you lose Kubai, which will be tough, uh, and you lose Fletcher, who's been like one of the, few constants of the last few years um, that, uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully you can reload, not rebuild. Just, mm -hmm. they, they have a lot sticking around. So this will be good to build that experience. Uh, also, before we move on to men's basketball, uh, Nell Fortner, ACC coach of the year. I'm, I'm thinking about it. I, I think that is, uh, that should happen personally. Uh, is I couldn't tell if the ACA ladies thing they were doing on ACC. Network. It's not real. I don't okay. think it's official. Okay, I was gonna say I didn't know if that was like the the official vote because she got uh, coach of the year in that I believe. Uh, Lodem 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 was most, most improved. improved. Yeah, and then there was an ACC Defensive Player of the Year. I think that Kubai. was Kubai. Yeah, that was that was Kubai. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's always it shows that they're uh, turning some heads. So won't uh, won't complain about that. We'll see that. Uh, it I will make one last note. They did take yeah. six losses in ACC play. They're a seven-loss team overall. That last loss, the extra loss, is obviously the Athens game from um, around Christmas. So, and, and, and if you look at the latest seed report, uh, which I think came out after the uh, Louisville game earlier today, if I remember correctly, uh, Athens was listed as a three seed in Stanford's region. We took them to uh, uh, overtime, too. So, and that's without Fletcher, if I remember correctly. So, correct. So, I mean, you're cooking with gas, really, the, on your strength of schedule, uh, especially considering the teams that you played. Um, and, and sort of the relative strength of the middle of the ACC uh, compared to most other conferences in women's yeah. basketball. It was pretty top heavy this year, but the, that midsection had a lot of teams in the like 30 to 70 range. So, you'll take that. Mm hmm. All right, let's pivot over to men's basketball, which is uh, sort of going in the opposite direction. They're streaking towards the tournament, um, hopefully. Uh, they're on a four-game win streak right now, which is uh, honestly something that I did not think I would say for a while, um, for a while there about this program, uh, especially in ACC play. Uh, it's still very weird to say that, uh, considering how this team has looked during my four or five years of watching, uh, watching it. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to take it. I think they are the in the last four in, according to Joe Lenardi at ESPN. 
Um, I think a lot of other metrics have them at, uh, locked in as an at-large bid based on their net and RPI ratings uh, yeah. and you know historical modeling. I am still cynical. <laughs> I still think they need an ACC tournament win <laughs> after um, this week. Pushing over Duke would be very excellent, uh, considering they are parked right around us on the bubble. Um, so mm-hmm. that, I think that Tuesday game is going to be pretty important. And then obviously have to take care of business versus Wake. But uh, Ken Palm is quite bullish on us, and I really like his projections uh, and, and how he's seen the tournament um, over the last uh, – well, he's been doing this for many years now. But, uh, 20, 25 years now, I think. Yeah, he, he has us at 32, um, and uh, that is – think- I think net it has us around there question mark. Net has us at, at 40 as of yesterday. But that was the 227 update. So I don't think that includes games from yesterday. Um, so we'll have to double back on that. Let's see. Let's see if the NCAA site um, has the NET for men's basketball. Um, Cause I pull off of a, uh, if you know, D one ticker, by the way, not an ad uh, D one ticker, very useful for uh email headlines about uh, college basketball. Here are Here is the games through the other day, though. We are at 39 in the NET God. rankings. So okay. about as poorly so, as you can get. <laughs> I th- so like, I think by net, you would expect us to be in. But again, you, I think you have to go at least one and one this week, if not two and oh. And I you also can't. like my we need to beat Wake Forest. Okay, so you you got to go one and one, let's say, and then you I personally I think you need a win in the NCAA tournament or not in the NCAA tournament the ACC tournament to get into the NCAA tournament. That's just the way I think things have been trending. Also, if you can't get the Duke monkey off your back here, which you already had two two bites of that apple previously and you spit them out. To, to really butcher a saying, um, speaking of last year and this year, with possibly the worst Duke team in three decades, you you gotta you gotta seal the deal here on Tuesday. You yeah. really gotta do it. Yeah, you you absolutely do. Um, Duke, uh, after losing to Louisville, tumbled from forty nine to fifty eight in the NET. Um, I think if you go off that, uh, it, it's pretty clear who uh, the NCAA would pick right now. But I feel like if if you if you lose to Duke again, it becomes very hard uh, as a comparable bubble team for the NCAA to say if if they're looking straight up at Georgia Tech and Duke for them to say yes, Georgia Tech is a better team. Put them in the tournament. We got to get the win. I think it's I think it's like the the CFP right where you have the head to head win and you can use that as evidence. Well, the head-to-head yep. series yeah. win at that point. I would agree. Um, I mean, but we're we're one to zero against them, so it would it would make it a tied series. But yeah, I, I get the point you're trying to make. Yeah, um, I yeah, I don't know if there's more I can talk about in terms of men's basketball. So let's move on to something uh, incredibly more frustrating, uh, shall we? Georgia Tech <laughs> softball. Uh, is on a is on a ten game losing streak. There's not a lot of nice takeaways or pleasant takeaways I have right now. There's also not uh, a lot of like, like fun ways to put the problems with this team. But let's try. Let's let's try. Uh, I mean, I th- <laughs> what do you, what I, do you I, think? We're man? just both speechless at this point. I think is the problem. <laughs> Yeah. It's just it, the level of – I don't know. It, for me, here's, here's a couple of things that I just have jotted down here. The pitching is not there. Like, the first and foremost, the pitching has definitely not been to the par that we expected. The bats have also quieted down immensely the last couple of days to the point where they got shut out today uh, in clean old-fashioned hate. Not great. And they only had two hits on the day, I believe. Um, versus Kennesaw State, I think they only scored one run. Uh, and then versus Miami of Ohio, they I think they had only a handful of runs in both of those games. It, it's it's a combination of uh, bad offensive play and no pitching. 
And it's the worst possible combination for a team that has a lot of potential and has a lot of talent. We saw that in the first weekend. It's just, I, I, I can't tell if they're getting unlucky in some of these situations, like where they're getting, you know, babbipped to death, or it's, they're, like, it's just not good. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and, I, and that's tough because, like, I feel like they're, we, we've seen that they have a pretty good, like, defense. I, I don't think, like, Babip would explain all of it unless they're just playing teams that have been really fortunate to find gaps. But the, the, the tough part, I think, is knowing that this team, I mean, I don't know about ranked, but, like, it has more potential and more talent than I think we've seen the last two weekends. Yeah, it, it's, I mean, even last weekend, you could have said, okay, they played all these teams, like they were playing Florida State, they were playing Clemson, teams that are, one of them that is currently ranked and another one that's receiving votes. I think you could have argued like, hey, these are quality losses. You can kind of eat them, like they suck, but you can eat them and move on. But when you're talking about Kennesaw State and Miami of Ohio and to I, I I mean even even the Athens one today you can kind of write off, but Kennesaw State and Miami of Ohio, come on now. I I mean yeah. again I'm saying this without knowing how good the MAC is at softball and how good the Big South is at softball, but just on like the face of it, come on. Yeah, the um, it, it it's tough to have to. You know, like it, it, you don't want to make it a self defeating cycle. I think right now, like the, the big takeaway is you have to wash off the losses and and go attack next weekend because it's back to ACC play, right? So mm-hmm. it, I don't have the schedule not, pulled up, but I assume it is. I'm pretty sure it's be a lot of rest uh, from here on out. Yeah, I mean, there's no. I think I think we see this also in in baseball, which we'll get to in a minute. It's there's no real days off. Like ACC play started more or less immediately. Um, and, and I mean, getting to the tournament is important and uh, get like getting to the NCAA tournament is important. And that national ranking and national notoriety is important, but you, I, you have to string together some wins in conference. I think we, we really hammered home that point about tech has the potential to be that second or third tier team really that second tier team after conference powers like Florida state, we saw Virginia tech also sort of establish themselves as tier two Clemson is sort of moving that into tier two, but tech has the talent. They have the players to be in that second tier and to sort of just take 10 losses in a row and not really look effective in the back half of those is, is frustrating. Ten losses. I mean, it's frustrating for us, but it's also probably yeah. frustrating for them, right? Yeah. But, like, the, the thing I was going to say is 10 losses is one thing, but, like, losses to Miami of Ohio and Kennesaw State are worse empirically than the losses to UGA or Florida State. Or something. A, I, I really wish I had the soundboard because I want to play the Taylor Twelman What Are We Doing video right now. <laughs> because it does, at a certain level, describe the way that I feel. I, I think, but I think we kind of have to answer that question, right? What do we need to do to fix this moving forward, going into the next ACC series? Yep. And you're the softball guy, so you tell me. Yeah, I, I think uh, you can't blame one facet. I don't think, like UGA. Oh, I agree. Is better UGA is a better team than us, and it showed. But you oh need boy, to did it show? You need to out hit Miami. Um, I'm not going to lay it all at the feet of the bats because like pitching has been pretty inconsistent, and you know you 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 walk. It's 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 the same thing you can say about college baseball. Walks hit by pitches errors are what lead to runs. Good teams mm-hmm. don't walk. They don't hit by pitch. They don't commit errors. We need to lock down on those things, be it pitching or in the field. And our bats need to come back. And when I say that, it sounds like I'm saying everything needs to be better across the board, which is a little bit unfair, but also a little bit true. So, yeah, that's what I got. Yeah, I don't, I don't have anything else, honestly. I think it just needs to be better, period. 
I, yeah. I know I feel like we're being a little bit hard on them and we are speaking negatively about a Georgia Tech program, but at the same time, I just don't feel like some of the performances are like up to the expectation that the program is set for itself. Yeah, I I like this program a lot. Uh, they have fantastic pieces. It's great to see what Jin Saleo is doing in field. Do not let – It's fantastic. She has an unassisted double play and a, and a triple play already this season. She's been doing great. It's just that the, none of the rest of the pieces are – like none of the rest of the pieces on the board are working together effectively, right? We saw the team play complete games basically the whole first weekend, and I don't think we've seen a truly – well, I mean, the, the, that, that's a tough part about this, this stretch has been they lost a couple very, very close games to a good Clemson and a good Florida State team. And that, that, that's tough. It, it, it is tough. And there's not a lot you can do about that other than shake it off and come back. And, uh, yeah, more shaking it off and coming back to do, I guess. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's, let's end on a good note with the last six minutes of stoppage time that we have. Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention that we did go into stoppage time. Um, Baseball had a very, very good week, I would say. Uh, They got a win midweek versus Mercer, and then they swept uh, also ranked NC State. Actually, NC State was ranked higher than them in most polls. Uh, I think we saw a questionable-ish pitching uh, situation in Game 3, but I think the hitting the entire Weekend was awesome. They outscored a ranked team like 25 to 8 on the weekend on the road. That's pretty darn yeah. good. They, they hit like four or five home runs. It was great. Including they three back-to-back-to-back back 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 home runs on, on Saturday. Yep. Um, I think it might be safe to say that EKU is going to be pretty good, and we were kind of rusty for that series. Um, but it was what, also what cold we when we previewed Just keep that. that in mind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what did we say when we previewed that? I, I don't know what you're leading to. I really, I don't know where you're trying to set up. I'm start doing a really bad team, job of this. Trying to start the season with NC state and Louisville. And yep. I think, uh, they beat both of our expectations for the weekend, right? So far. Yeah. I'm impressed. Yeah. I mean, I think we've learned from softball about keeping our expectations too high, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I did also say that swimming and diving had a shot at uh, a top five finish last week. So maybe we are just the uh, Kool-Aid drinking podcast. It's, it's, I don't know, like gold Kool-Aid. What, would that, what flavor would that be? Pineapple? Lemon? Ugh. Lemonade, I guess. I like either of those, but yeah, I think that's what we got to go with. <sighs> it's fine. I, I think the biggest issue that baseball has if you can really call it an issue is sort of the interchange between Kevin Parada and Jake Holland the catcher and Holland also filling in as the DH a couple times I think my my gut feeling here is you say you keep Parada at catcher because his performance there has been really good uh and you definitely still want him in the lineup and then you sort of platoon Holland with I think it was Jenkins that was also playing some DH personally. Yeah. I don't think we've seen Jenkins the last two days though, and that's a little bit of a bummer. But uh, mm-hmm. Prada, Prada, he went four for four and a walk uh, in game one, and I mean it, he he slowed down a little bit uh, on Saturday, but he he is playing his way into a he needs to start. And the one thing I will caveat your comment with is it is a lot harder to be an everyday catcher than it is to be an everyday anywhere else. So if his knees True. need a break or like, I don't want to wear him into the ground in year one here, you know, he's got, mm-hmm. he's got too much talent to break uh, on the third weekend of the, of his freshman year. So uh, mm-hmm. I, I will say it's fine to see Holland in there for spells, but I mean, I think it's, what's been- your, who's your primary, your primary in the ACC tournament is going to be Parada. Like that, yeah. that's the way that I'm thinking about it. Yes, that's fair. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, I do. Yeah, I, I don't know what the ceiling is for this team anymore, kind of, because I think we sort of set the bar at, at, uh, at, at well, where words. We set the bar at making the tournament and hosting a regional, I think. 
I think if you keep up these performances against the really good teams on your schedule, read the entire ACC, you're setting yourself up for success there and in the regional. I mean, the regional is where Tech has had trouble historically, but I think I think you're setting yourself up for success. Whether that success happens is, you know, the secondary part of the part of the job here. I would uh, love to have a reason to buy tickets for beautiful breezy Omaha this year. I would too. Uh, you know, it, it would be <laughs> be a fun trip, in the middle of the country. Not much to do there, I think, other than watch baseball. But uh, it would be a reason to watch baseball. I believe it's the week before uh, Olympic trials. Um, and I think the Century Link Center or whatever that building's called now. So, oh, you've you've tempted me now. I'm I'm now I'm now processing how much that would cost, and I'm marginally interested. I can't get too ahead of myself. Yeah. That'd be a good way to spend two weeks. A very good way to sp- spend two weeks. Also, we're talking about Olympic swim trials, by the way. The uh... It's it's divided into two weeks, uh, June fourth through the seventh, and thirteenth through the twentieth. Um, I don't know where it. I, I believe it's Omaha. Yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah. Omaha. They signed a deal with Omaha for the next couple of years, if I remember correctly. Yep. Um, but uh, yeah, it'll be it'll be back in Omaha. It's, I mean, they're literally walking. We we parked at the uh, arena when. Uh, when I went to the college world series just for the fun of it in like 2013 or whatever it was with my dad. Um, but I, I don't know if they even have spectators. Um, so we'll missed opportunities. Yep. Damn you. COVID taking, taking away arguably one of the most fun trips that we could ever think up. Damn Dude, you COVID. That, it, that would be very sad to miss a Georgia tech, um, a very Georgia Tech and very sporty once in a really, frankly, lifetime opportunity with that. But, you know, that's life. You live and you learn. Okay, Mr. Grant, do you have anything else before we wrap up today? can't say I do. Uh, it's too dark to be wearing shades right now, so I'm going to go take those off, and uh, we'll see them again next week, right? Hopefully not. Uh, listeners, thank you all for listening. Uh, And we will see you again very soon.